Joshua 3. Joshua chapter... I, I, I meant to say Joshua chapter 1. I don't know why I said 3. Joshua chapter 1. Two weeks ago, we began a series on biblical leadership, and we began by asking a question, a practical question, and that is, should we desire to be great? Should we desire to be great? Now, it's kind of a loaded question because you have to qualify it by asking whether we're speaking of greatness uh, the way the world speaks of it, or whether we're talking about greatness the way that God speaks of it. And that would be our context this evening, and so the answer to the question ought to be yes. Yes, we ought to desire to be great. Uh, we had for our text Matthew 20, and we looked at James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and the mother of their mother who came and asked Jesus for the privilege of his sitting uh, on their on his their sitting on his right hand and on his left when he came into his kingdom. And it certainly caused a dissension among the disciples. Boy, the rest of the disciples began to murmur against James and John because they wanted to be in the foremost position as disciples. And it's kind of important as believers for us to analyze that question because the reality of it is, was it wrong for James and John to desire to be the greatest? In other words, when James and John's mother came and asked Jesus, hey, Lord, permit that my sons would sit on your right hand on your left when you come into your kingdom, certainly she would have been willing to accept any requirements for that to happen. Sometimes I believe it's a false pretense of humility that Christians use as an excuse for mediocrity, for settling, for not seeking eternal reward. And I want to remind you as a Christian that the Scripture has a lot to say about reward for a believer. So if we define greatness as seeking an eternal reward, I think every Christian ought to desire to be great, oughtn't we? Well, I want to read this evening. Last week we had looked at the example of Paul as a servant. We saw that Jesus told his disciples that in order to be great, they needed to be a servant. The person who's least is the uh, is is the greatest, and the person who's greatest is the least, and the greatest person is the servant of all. And so I want to look this evening at the example of a man who was a servant of a servant, Joshua. And so let's begin by reading verse 1, and then we will pray again and ask the Lord's understanding. Am I hearing a ringing in my ears, or is that a real ringing? That's a ring? Okay. This sound is... Um, it's, I, I figured out what was wrong with it. I saw a light flashing here, and it said, Rude Solo. <laughs> Rude Solo light. So... One of y'all got up here and tried to sing a solo. <laughs> and this sound's never going to be the same. So, anyway, it, uh, that's what it said, root solo. It was flashing. Like they said, root solo. Like, so, that's all I know. Verse 1, Joshua 1. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise... Go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel. Well, we'll pray. Father, as we look at this place that Joshua has come to in the final 30 years of his life, and as we see that he's a man who has, humanly speaking, achieved a lot, I pray that you would help us to apply the principles of Joshua's <clears throat> lives, life in a way that would help us in our lives. And we ask for your help now in Jesus' name. Amen. Greatness. I think every one of us this evening would agree that uh, two out of a couple million is pretty good odds. In other words, as far as entering into the promised land, Joshua and Caleb were it. From the individuals that began the journey from being servants, or slaves I should say, in Egypt. You think about Joshua and the journey of his life. By the time we come to Joshua chapter 1 and verse 1, and the Lord says, 
my servant is dead. Joshua, you're going to be the leader of Israel. By the time Joshua comes from that place, he's come a long way in his life, hasn't he? In other words, if there is a dream story or a success story or somebody really coming from the lowest place to the highest place, it's a guy that was born a slave in Egypt under bondage, under terrible oppression. The things that were happening in Egypt were terrible. Uh, the, the, the Hebrew children by Pharaoh were ordered to be murdered, to be massacred. Uh, Pharaoh did not fear God because they were God's chosen people and because uh, of God's blessing on Israel. Uh, Pharaoh desired to not just bring them into bondage, but to actually eradicate or stamp out God's people. And so Josh was born into as strong as anti-Semitic climate as there's ever been. There's always been a strong anti-Semitic climate, but he was born into one. And he was born a slave and probably felt as though he were fortunate to even be born. I want to look at this evening characteristics of a servant because Joshua was a servant. Now you can turn there or, or uh, you don't have to. Maybe if you're taking notes, write down the reference. Uh, I want to just look at some characteristics of a servant. One is, is in Proverbs chapter 25. And uh, first I want to say about Joshua that I don't believe, if you look at the life of Joshua, that he ever sought self-promotion. In other words, he was, according to Joshua 1.1, 1, 1, Joshua was described as Moses' minister. And we'll see more about that in a moment. In uh, verse 6 of Proverbs 25, the Scripture says, Put not forth thyself in the presence of the king, and stand not in the place of great men. For better it is that it be said unto thee, Come up hither, than that thou shouldst be put lower in the presence of the prince, whom thine eyes have seen. Christian, I want to urge you that a great person does not self-promote ever. It is amazing to me, even in ministry, how oft times individuals engage in self-promotion. It's, it's a little humorous when you hear preachers name drop talking about friends of theirs who are preachers and uh, talking about who they know. It's amazing to me when preachers promote themselves. I'm embarrassed, actually. And, I, and this is not... I'm not trying to criticize anybody or anything. And I understand there could be other reasons by it, but I'm a little bit embarrassed by platforms with a pulpit presence. You know what I'm talking about? The people that sit on the platform that don't do anything. By that, I mean, you know, they're not preaching. Elders. Uh, well, whatever it is. And I don't think it's wrong. And, and I grew up in a church that did that. I've gone to churches that, that have that. I just It's just a little embarrassing to me to think, why is a person put on the platform? Well, you say, because we want people to know their leadership. Well, biblically speaking, how do we know that someone is a leader? Because they serve. Would it be hard to figure out who a leader is in a church if they were servants? Now, I don't want to deduce, you know, come to a, uh, an unkind conclusion, but maybe it's because people wouldn't know they were servants otherwise. Now, I know that that's probably, that probably would be untrue in 99% of the instances. But you understand what I'm saying about it? In other words, why do we do some of the things that we do? Sometimes we have a way of promoting or putting up people, and the Bible says that as far as promotion goes, that it is better for us, it's better to be said to us, come up here. In other words, come up here, rather than we come up ourselves and say, I belong here. Uh, many times in our ministry, we've had individuals that have contacted us interested in coming to the church, and uh, they would say, to minister. I'm, I'm thinking I may be better off without this sound. You think so? It's really got a ring to it. I'm okay tonight. I guess I'll have to have it. All right. Sometimes... People will call and say, Pastor Price, I want to come and I want to minister. And they, yeah, well, how do you want to minister? Well, I want to sing or I want to do this or I want to do that. And they're interested actually in attending the church on a permanent basis. And I understand a person wanting to come and to serve. But oftentimes it's a matter of, I'm looking for a place where I can be in the front, in the forefront, in, the for, in, the, in front of people, or that I can be acknowledged. It's amazing too, as well, uh, when a person, for instance, leads worship. I'm fine with terms like leading worship. Is that, they're okay terms, aren't they? I was filling out today uh, an order for tracks, 
and I noticed that the track company didn't put worship service on the 11 a.m. service. And I kind of don't blame them for it, do you? Because of what worship is called now, I think they're kind of trying to move away from the sound of a contemporary service and so forth. But worship is what we're supposed to do in our services. But when somebody wants to lead worship, you know, they'll call on the phone, hey, I'd like to speak to your worship leader. What are they talking about? Well, they're talking about the person who, you know, leads worship. Now we've got, and again, I sound like I'm ranting this evening. I really don't feel like I actually am. But I notice when I visit churches that you have a song leader, but then you have like three or four other people that stand up here and sing along with the song. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody in one of these churches? you got to have people on the platform singing in congregational singing. And, and I, I'm not sure I know where all that came from, but I think a lot of it has to do with worshiping and leading. And I'm going to just tell you something, my friend. Worshiping isn't a person being exalted or lifting up. Be very careful about uh, complimenting special music, for instance. I think as a Christian, you ought to be really careful about it. A couple of things that you shouldn't do if you do special music. First of all, if you're going to sing, get up and sing. Just get up and sing. If you're going to sing, uh, uh, you don't have to say, I'm so-and-so, and introduce yourself. You don't have to say, this song really speaks to me, and then explain what the song's about. I always tell people, you have to explain what the words of the song tell you. Pick a song that actually has words that tell you what it's saying, because it's not a good song. And then, uh, be careful, Christian, about complimenting people who sing. Listen, if they have a beautiful voice, the Lord gave it to them. They ought to use it for the Lord. They ought to. If they've got a mediocre voice and they did a good job and they did as well as they possibly could and it was, it was a blessing, then thank the Lord for it. But the reality is, Christian, is that uh, when a person is worshiping the Lord Jesus, if it lifts up the person, it distracted from the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it would be possible... Don't, don't go and create some strange doctrine out of this, okay? Don't make some, some weird church rule. But I think it would be possible for a person to do such a good job that the Lord Jesus gets missed entirely. And I'm, saying, I'm not saying at all a person ought to be uh, unprepared or slovenly or anything like that. But Jesus needs to be lifted up. And if He hasn't lifted up, then, then uh, you've missed the purpose, the point of it. And a servant, a, a leader is a servant. And so I want to say, beginning first of all, that a Christian who desires to lead waits his turn. Uh, I remember being in Bible college and in seminary when it would seem as though if a prominent preacher came, all the young men wanted to go up and introduce themselves. You know, it's one thing you want to ask a guy a question because he has a lot of wisdom, but you know the guy's probably not interested in me. I always felt like, you know, they're not really interested in meeting me. You know, I'm Ryan Price. Well, who in the world cares? And that, that ought to be the attitude of somebody that loves people, but the reality of it is is that it doesn't really matter who I am. Does it? I don't need somebody who I think is prominent to know who I am. Why? Well, because it's the Lord Jesus Christ that's prominent. If that person needs me, if the Lord needs me in something, then they'll say, come up hither. And Christian, I just want to tell you something. We've got a real problem with self-promotion. The whole networking going on in ministries where uh, preachers try to get to know other preachers so that they can, you know, have... <laughs> have the, you know, you come preach in my church, and then I'll come preach in your church, and you know, we'll kind of just work our way up in that kind of sort of thing. My friend, we don't need that. It doesn't have any part in being a servant. Christian, what a person ought to do, what a believer ought to do, is take a back seat. Let someone else have the front seat, have that comfortable place, and if God wants it, and if it's needful for you to step forward, then someone will say, come up hither. And the Bible says it's better that it would be said to you to come up hither than that thou shouldest be put lower in the, prince, in the presence of the prince whom thine eye hath seen. If you take a place of preeminence or importance that doesn't belong to you, if things are made right, you'll be, you'll be, you'll be pushed back or pushed away. And that's kind of hard, isn't it? It's kind of, a, kind of a worse than if you've never been in that place. Joshua was a servant of Moses. Uh, let's go back to Exodus, if you will, please. I want us to remember, what was Moses? Servant. Servant. Moses is probably the greatest leader of Israel, wouldn't you say? I mean, he's, he's the guy who at 80 years of, of age with a speech impediment went into Egypt with the full power of God 
and said to Pharaoh, let my people go. And God used him to lead them in the wilderness. But if Moses was anything, Moses was a servant. The reality of it is, is that if you ever think about the task that Moses had, was Moses the greatest man of his day? Is there any argument about it? Would it be okay to say he was the greatest man of his day? I don't think there's any argument. There's no question about that, is there? So if he's the greatest man of his day, how many of you would like to have greatness in the way that Moses had it? I mean, he was the constant target. For 40 years, when people complained about God, they complained about God and Moses. Moses. I mean, he was the automatic bad guy. Uh, they probably didn't hold Moses appreciation banquets, you know, once a year, and everybody wrote nice cards, and he got like a couple million cards from the children of Israel and nice gifts, and just felt appreciated. If anyone in the world was ever underappreciated, it was the guy that God had lead people from Egypt into the wilderness. Now that wilderness journey was necessary for God's people, wasn't it? The Scripture describes a lot of reasons why uh, Moses had to lead the children of Israel in the wilderness. First of all, they weren't men of war. They came from being servants and they had a servant mindset, and so they weren't ready to fight. God could certainly have taken them in the land of Canaan, but the second issue, and a major issue, was that they had grown very accustomed to idolatry. And that was why the children in the land of Canaan, not the children, but the inhabitants of Canaan, were being driven out. If they'd gone in directly from Egypt, they'd have taken a lot of idols with them. It's amazing how quickly, when Moses is away, that the people in Aaron made an idol. I mean, just instantly, they were idol worshippers. They were idolatrous. They didn't seek out Moses. They didn't send a messenger out to Moses where he was tending his father-in-law's sheep and say, hey Moses, you know, we'd like to make a breakaway and we're wondering if you'd be willing to be the servant and come lead us. The fact of the matter is they were kind of forced out of Egypt by Pharaoh himself. And it wasn't very long after that they were lamenting Egypt. They had Egypt in them. Had a lot of Egypt in them. And so Moses had a task of leading ungrateful people who... Um, we're not lovely to administer to. And he had to lead them until they died in the wilderness. I mean, that isn't really much of an end to your ministry, is it? You have to live until the last person that was an adult when he came out of Egypt dies. The last person born in Egypt dies. As soon as the people that were born in Egypt die, then Moses, your ministry is over. You talk about a... Uh, <coughs> Kind of a ministry without a great future to it. Moses, for much of his lifetime, also had to lead the children of Israel knowing that he himself would not enter into the land of promise. And we know that that was his own sin, but my friend, what a tough ministry. I can't imagine being Moses, being called to be Moses. Moses was a servant. He was a leader. So if Joshua was anything, Joshua was a servant of a servant. Here we are in uh, Exodus chapter 24. I'd like to look at uh, verse 13. Well, let's look at verse 12. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And the Bible says, And Moses rose up and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God. Now this evening we're focusing on, we're looking at this individual Joshua. Where did, where did Moses go? Up the mount. Up the mount to where? To the presence of God. To be with God. And Joshua was Moses' servant. The Bible says Moses went up and Joshua went up, and Mo Joshua stayed in a place on the way up there. And I want us to notice Joshua's position. Joshua's not in the come up hither place. God doesn't say, Moses, come up and bring Joshua because, you know, he's every bit as much as you are. He's every bit as important as you are. Now, was Joshua every bit as good a man as Moses was? I think probably so. Uh, he had a good reputation. You can't tell me anything about Joshua in his life that he didn't please God. Any aspect of his life where he didn't please God. So why was it that God called Moses up and he didn't say, well, you know what, Joshua's a good fellow. Bring him too. Because Moses was the leader of Israel at the time and Joshua wasn't. My friend, 
It's important for ourselves, if we are servants, we all ought to be, it's important to understand that your position in service has nothing to do with your godliness or your importance. Joshua was not left behind because he was unimportant. He was left behind because he wasn't, the, he wasn't Moses. There was only one Moses, and that was the one God needed. You know, sometimes it bothers us. Sometimes it frustrates us that, hey, that person gets called up and, you know, they're not better than me. That person gets to, uh, gets to be in this position and why oughtn't I? Well, you know what Moses was? Moses was God's servant. You know what Joshua was? Joshua was Moses' servant. And Christian, we need to have a contentment in us. Serving God where we ought to. It's amazing. Uh, when we read in Exodus chapter 1, I mean, in Joshua chapter 1, it's amazing to think that Joshua is born in Egypt and has wandered at this point in the wilderness for 40 years. We know Caleb was about 80 years shortly thereafter. We have assumed that Joshua is near the age of Caleb. He's about 80 years old. He doesn't have much time left. He dies at 110, so I guess he would have been you know, 80 years old. We make this assumption about Joshua. We realize he's 40 when he leaves Egypt. He is in the wilderness for 40 years, and he doesn't get to be the leader of Israel until he's 80 years old. Same as Moses, by the way. Joshua was born as a slave in Egypt. He went through the hardships, the bondages in Egypt. He witnessed the salvation of God delivering His people. God chose Joshua not to lead Israel during Moses' life, but after the death of Moses. Let's look... Um, Back at chapter 1 of Joshua, again, if you will. I'll point out that God did choose him to lead Israel now after the death of Moses. And that's where we'll pick up now. The Bible says, verse 1, Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, and the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel. Joshua was a servant. He was not the boss. He was assistant of Moses. He ran errands. He did odd jobs. He didn't care about his own personal gain or honor. He, he served his master and the people. He did the dirty work. There wasn't a task for Joshua that was too menial for him to do. But I want to see as well that not only was he a servant, but he was a faithful servant. He was a faithful assistant. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, verses 19 and 20, a faithful man shall abide, abound with blessing. I'm sorry, verse, verse 20. He that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread, but he that followeth after vain persons shall have poverty enough. And one of the things I think that oftentimes we face with serving is that we're unwilling to start at the bottom. We're unwilling to start by being nothing. I remember when I was in seminary. I went back to college, and Dr. Earl Jessup uh, came in, into a church planting class, and he spoke to us. Man, he said something, and I thought it wasn't very unkind at the time, and I kind of agree with it uh, today. He said, you young fellas, he said, not a single one of you is worth a salary. <laughs> he said, in ministerial, to all these guys, there's guys that some of them had, had a four-year degree, had, uh, you know, worked internships and that sort of thing, but some of them were in, in seminary, getting their masters and so forth. I'd been out for four years and come back to seminary. And he said, not a single one of you is worth paying. And uh, he said, you need to go find a preacher and volunteer in a church. Work hard enough to be worth paying and then get a salary. He said, you ought to be ashamed if you just take a salary uh, just because you got a four-year degree. And I thought, well, that's a little bit harsh. He probably stated a little harshly. But you know, it's mostly true. It's mostly true. You know, the fact is, truth is, is that you're not worth a lot until you can produce something, until you can do something. Isn't it true? How many, how many folks, um, how many businesses thrive on workers that don't produce? Not very many, are there? You know, you've got to have a pretty good system to not need people to be productive. A lot of times... We want to have leadership. We want to have responsibility, but we don't want to earn our way. We don't want to work our way to that place of, of leadership. And Joshua was nothing when he worked for Moses. He didn't have any promise. Now let me ask you a question. In Israel, 
normally, usually, what happened as far as leadership went when a leader died? Who was usually the next leader if a leader died? Usually their son. You ever think about it from Joshua's perspective? Do you think that Joshua had a hope of being the future leader of Israel? I don't think so. I don't think it was his ambition. I don't think it's what he desired. Joshua became leader of Israel because God chose him to be leader of Israel. And you would think, based on the history, based on the way things were, that one of Moses' sons would have been the leader. And yet it wasn't so at all. Um, Joshua wasn't concerned about who would get the glory or the credit. Luke 10, uh, Luke 16, 10 says, He that is faithful in the least is in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Character is important in a servant, isn't it? If you want to be a servant, you've got to have good character. If you're dishonest about little things, you'll be dishonest with large things. It's humbling to think sometimes of why you don't have much, isn't it? You ever wonder about, you know, why does that person have so much? Well, if everything you have comes from God, and God didn't give you very much, what's the natural deduction? <laughs> You're not very faithful. Now, I'm not saying this evening if a person is not wealthy that he's, not, that he's an unfaithful person. There are stewards with different talents, different amounts, different abilities. But friend, if you're not faithful in a small thing and you expect God to give you large things, you have an expectation that's both unreasonable and also is not befitting a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. A servant takes menial tasks seriously and goes about them diligently. A servant doesn't say, why was I asked to do this? A servant asks whether or not they can do it and perform the task. And don't feel slighted. Because, well, I wonder why. You know, sometimes from a leadership perspective, you'd be amazed at how easy it is to find somebody to do a big thing and how difficult it is to find somebody to do something simple. And yet the person doing the big thing, maybe the reason they're doing it is because they've been faithful in that which is least, but maybe the big thing isn't so big. Maybe the, the one who knows and looks on the heart is far more impressed with the task that a person with character performs justly and honestly. In uh, Colossians chapter 3, we see a command to slaves, bond servants, servants, obey all things. In all things your masters according to flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily, as unto the Lord, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. A servant remembers, I'm not serving a person. I'm serving the Lord Jesus. When Joshua served Moses, when Joshua served Israel, Joshua served God. Like Moses, Joshua was a man of God. When Moses went up the mountain, up to the mountain in the wilderness of Sinai, Moses went up higher, but Joshua waited. The Bible says Moses arose with his assistant, with his servant Joshua. When Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, where was Joshua? By the way, what happened when Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights? What happened? What? People rebelled against God. They were in idolatry. Where was Moses? I mean, where was Moses? He was on top of the mountain. Where was Joshua? He was halfway up the mountain. Can you imagine being a servant waiting 40 days on your master? Where's Moses at for 40 days? Boy, thank God. You, know, you wonder if you know he was the whipping boy for Moses. I'm joking a little bit about that. Moses threw the tablets down. I wonder if Joshua had to duck. But he wasn't there when they committed adultery. Idolatry. He was waiting on the Lord, and He was waiting on Moses. You know, sometimes, friend, it's very, very difficult to realize as a servant that we have to wait. Wait a moment. 
See, for Joshua, the question is, what is my life going to be about? What are the promises that are for me? And the answer to the question was, he had the promises that all Israel had, but there was nothing specific for Joshua about being the leader of Israel. God chose him. I believe God chose him because of his qualifications. Joshua is a faithful witness. If you go to in, in, in Joshua, go a few chapters forward to Joshua chapter 14. Look at verse 6. Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee, and Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses the servant of the Lord sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. He talks about the brethren that went with him. And we know this account of the Scripture, don't we? Joshua and Caleb were individuals that, though it were popular, though it were the thing to do, to give a bad report. You know, you wonder about this because we know Joshua was Moses' servant. We know Joshua was a model of a servant. He was a representative, I believe, for the tribe of Ephraim. You wonder about what was going through the mind of Joshua and Caleb when they came back and said, yes, we saw Mount, we saw not mountains, giants. And Joshua's perspective was, let's go. The Lord can deliver them into our hand. God can give us the victory. You know, when you don't think too much of yourself, you're more likely to think a lot of God. And a servant, a minister, thinks not much of himself, but he thinks a lot of his master. When you have a big view of yourself, you always have a small view of God. And Joshua, when he came back from spying out the land, his response was, who are they compared to God? You know, sometimes we think we've got to solve problems. We've got to take care of matters. We think we have to have answers for things and we forget that God could just take care of those things instead of us. But our problem is, is we have too great a view of ourselves and too small a view of God. And Joshua had an appropriate perspective of himself an appropriate perspective of who God was. I've said many times that the definition for humility is not a person pretending to be less than they are, but it is a person understanding what he is before God. If I'm humble, it isn't that I don't that I think I'm that I'm acting as though I'm less than something. The reality is, if I have humility, I realize that I'm nothing compared to God. You don't have to do any pretending. We don't have to do any acting. We don't need a pretense of humility. We need to have a big understanding of what a great God is that we serve. And Joshua understood that. I believe it was one of his qualifications. When we see Joshua being told you're going to lead Israel, we see it's because he was a faithful witness. Joshua's on the right team. In... Uh, Chapter 5, if you look back a couple of verses. Verse 13. came to pass, and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith the Lord unto my servant, unto his servant? Joshua understood ultimately, I'm not leading the children of Israel into the land of Canaan. I'm serving the children of Israel as, as we follow the Lord Jesus in the land of Canaan. When this individual says, I'm captain of the Lord's host. Joshua very well could have said, now wait a second, God said I was the leader of Israel. Who are you? And this individual very well could tell him who he was. No, Joshua fell down. And he said, I'm your servant. He worshipped him. 
friend, an individual who has a hard time bowing, bending, or serving is a person who does not worship. So many times this problem of preeminence goes deeper than just an unwillingness to serve in order to be great. The problem of preeminence comes to comes down to the reality that we desire to be worshipped instead of worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you cannot serve, and if you will not serve, my friend, you have a problem with worship. Joshua was faithful. He was a faithful witness. He was on the right team. He was serving God. By the way, serving is not serving unless it's serving God. Listen, you, you don't serve the wrong master. You serve God. And so Joshua understood that. And God promoted Joshua. Joshua chapter 3, if you go back just a couple of verses, and I'll be done here in a minute. We see that Joshua's promotion was from God Himself. Verse 7, The Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. It's very interesting about this, isn't it? Joshua begins, and he's nothing but a servant, servant of Moses. He's just faithful. He doesn't promote himself. He doesn't exalt him. God makes him the leader of Israel. And when he goes to lead Israel, they kind of say, who are you? <laughs> you know, a servant doesn't have a problem if he's been called to lead. He doesn't have a problem with people questioning, questioning his right to lead. It ought to bother you. If God's called you to something, if, if people are bothered by it or somebody doesn't want to follow your leadership. God said, Joshua, I'll take care of that. He said, from now on, He said, I'm going to magnify you in the eyes of the children of Israel. Again, there's no need for self-promotion. There's no need to defend His position. Joshua doesn't have to say, I'm the only person that survived the wilderness. I'm the only person besides Caleb that was faithful. I'm the only person that didn't worship idols. I'm the only one. He doesn't have to look at his track record and point out those things. God just said, I'll magnify you. My friend, God is the one who's able to give you grace in people's eyes. Isn't it wonderful what God did with King David? Isn't it wonderful what God does did with Daniel? and Hananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah in Babylon. God can give you grace. Hey, those men were nothing but servants, and yet, at one day, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in the end, those individuals became the leaders. Joseph was nothing but a servant. He was a servant in Potiphar's house. He was a servant in prison. He was a servant in Pharaoh's house, and yet he was the greatest man in all of Egypt. And Joshua, my friend, is an example of a servant. And God said, Joshua, I'll magnify you in the eyes of the people. Joshua was, was close to God. I want us to look at this. And go back again, if you will, with me to Exodus chapter 33. I'd like to look at verse 7. Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. And it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man in his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose up and worshipped, every man in his tent door. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into his tent. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, <clears throat> departed not out of the tabernacle. And from this portion of the Scripture, we see that Joshua, when he saw the presence of God, and when he saw God speaking with Moses as with a friend, Joshua said, I want that relationship with God. He desired to have a relationship with God. My friend, you'll never want to be great if you get to know God. 
I'm not talking about greatness God's way. I'm talking about greatness man's way. You'll never need to self-promote if you know God. You'll know the greatest. And when you know the greatest, you know there's no sense in trying to usurp or to uh, come up with your own authority. We know Joshua gave a good report when the spies were sent out. That would be Numbers 13, verses 32 through 37. I want to conclude this evening by saying that John, Joshua received the promise and the promotion. Uh, in verse 14 of Numbers 30, the Scripture says, Doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. And after Moses' death, Joshua was chosen by God Himself to be the successor. If you read further, you see that he led the children of Israel to conquer giants, that he personally supervised the division of the territories of each of the tribes as they inherited the land of Canaan. And we know as well when you read the end that the elders who served under Joshua after Joshua's death, that the testimony was, was that they still served the Lord all the way till their death. And so Joshua had a legacy that lived after him of honoring God. A Christian, as we've looked at Joshua this evening, the reality of it is, is that the summary of Joshua's life is somewhat discouraging sometimes. Uh, we don't have an individual in this room that is as old as Joshua was when he was promoted to be leader of Israel. Think on that. No one in this room this evening has served as nothing as long as Joshua did before God made him leader of Israel. Think on that. And Joshua, all that time that he served the Lord God, didn't promote himself, didn't need to raise himself. And yet we know what Joshua was. We have the testimony of Scripture. More importantly than that, God knew what Joshua was. And I want to remind you this evening that it's appropriate for every believer to desire to be great. You don't desire to be great. What you desire to do is just waste your life. To do nothing. And that isn't what God put you on this earth for. God gave you life. It's a gift. And He wants you to serve Him. But friend, that service has reward. But don't misunderstand. Don't mistake it. God didn't put you here to reign or to rule in someone else's life. God didn't put you here to rise to a place of prominence or preeminence so that your name could be recognized. God put you here so that you could accomplish something that He made you for. It's amazing, isn't it, that God made you for a purpose? And yet, when you look at the odds in the nation of Israel and you see a couple million Jews see a couple of guys and really just one to serve the way Joshua did. And that is not intended this evening by way of conclusion to discourage anyone. I'm not saying this evening, hey, you can't be great unless you, you know, are one in a couple million. What I'm saying this evening is that you can't be great unless you are faithful in that which is least. And the question this evening, as the Lord knows the heart of every individual, is what am I when God looks at me? What does it matter how a person looks at you? What does God think about you and your willingness to serve? Here's a second question. If you're a servant, what's your business? If you're a servant, what's your business? It isn't actually that hard to know, is it? For Joshua, sometimes he'd say, he'd say well, you know, I spent some time as a spy. That was my business. I spent some time halfway up Mount Sinai sitting 40 days worth waiting for Moses to come back down. That's my business. He could have said, well, you know what? I just I, I stayed around the tabernacle because that's where God was. And I wanted to be near the Lord and I did whatever needed to be done. That was my business. Most of Joshua's life though, he would have to say, well, you say, Joshua, what do you do? Whatever Moses tells me to do. Well, what's Moses tell you to do usually? Well, get him a cup of water. <laughs> Go talk to this guy. Speak to this person. Do this, do that. Joshua, you're a gopher. Go for this, go for that. Yeah, that's pretty much it. That's what I am. Well, Joshua, what's it like? You know, just being treated like a slave. And Joshua would tell you, I'm serving God. It's pretty wonderful because I know the person. 
who's the most powerful person in the world. I know a person who can do anything. And when you know God, it's not at all a feeling, <laughs> a bad feeling to know that you're just a servant. It's a wonderful thing to serve God. It's good. It's good to serve God's servant Moses. And Christian, I wonder if you and I perhaps would fit more into the category of the couple million because we wouldn't want a job like that. We might miss out on something wonderful because we're unwilling to have the patience and the waiting and the unwillingness to promote ourselves. Simply just serve. But my friend, that's what greatness is. Jesus had modeled it, showed it by example. God Himself in the flesh coming to this earth and serving man. My friend, king of men is too low a title for the king of kings and lord of lords. And yet he washed his disciples' feet and showed them that this is what you do in order to serve. When you're called on to serve, what's your mindset? What's your attitude? What's your response? Are you a servant? Or are you more like the person who is served? Friend, nothing against being served, but the great person is the one who serves. Father, thank you for what you've taught us this evening. I pray that you'd help it to apply to our lives in a practical way that we can live, even, even today and even this week. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's take some prayer requests tonight, shall we?